Should we go ahead and start? You all ready? Uh, good afternoon, Veterans for Peace. So glad to be here. Uh, I'm here with uh, Father Bill Bixell, and we'll share the podium. I'm going to start uh, with the slideshow that I've developed for the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action, which we've used before our gatherings at Ground Zero, uh, going out to confront the Trident submarine system. I've updated it uh, for folks here today. Uh, I'm Dave Hall. I'm a child adolescent psychiatrist, uh, former national and local president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and a longtime uh, member of the Ground Zero Center uh, since the middle 80s. My uh, college reunion book actually had me with creosote on the butt of my pants when we sat on the tracks out in front of the banger base uh, way back in the 80s. What I have here today is a talk about a slideshow about 20 minutes long that will cover uh, medical consequences and uh, the political policies behind the United States uh, still very firm central commitment to nuclear weapons as our projected presence around the world. Why am I doing this work? Nuclear weapons present quite possibly the gravest threat to human health. They violate laws of war and humanitarian law. They preempt enormous resources needed for direct human benefit. And I consider them the cancerous vestiges of the 20th century wars. 1986 was almost a watershed. Uh, Presidents Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik and came very close to agreeing to eliminate nuclear weapons. The stumbling block was the United States refusal uh, to hold off on uh, the missile shield, Star Wars, uh, long enough to try to negotiate something. And the rapprochement at that point fell apart. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists in 1947 uh, developed uh, the atomic clock. This is the doomsday clock, which puts all human history into 24 hours. Uh, so at the end of 24 hours, that's the end of human history. Uh, the closest we came uh, was three minutes to midnight, three minutes to the end of civilization in the 80s around uh, the confrontations between the US and the Soviet Union and, and during the missile crisis in uh, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, it's currently five minutes to midnight, uh, and it's been stuck here. Uh, 2012 is the last time it, uh, it moved. Uh, and just to uh, share a little bit of this with you, uh, 2012 was the hottest year on record in cont the contiguous United States, marked by devastating drought and brutal storms. These extreme events are exactly what climate models predict for an atmosphere laden with greenhouse gases. It was also a year of unrealized opportunity to reduce nuclear stockpiles to lower the immediacy of destruction from weapons on alert and to control the spread of fissile materials and keep nuclear terrorism at bay. We are passing up all kinds of opportunities. Um, this is a look at Seattle from uh, across Hood Canal. And it, this showed up in the Seattle Times. Uh, and they didn't realize that the, the brown on the bottom of the picture is Swiftpack. It's the nuclear weapons storage facility on the Banger base. Uh, they thought that the water between Seattle and here was Hood Canal. In fact, it's Liberty Bay. Uh, just near Paulsbo. But this is where uh, Bangor is the site of where uh, roughly half of the active nuclear weapons in the United States arsenal uh, are, uh, are staged. Just a tribute here to Bix, who's here with me. Uh, this is the Disarm uh, Five Plowshares group that entered the Bangor base on November 2nd, 2009. Spent four hours on the base with uh, Bix uh, popping his nitroglycerin as they sort of walked in the open uh, into the secure area where the nuclear weapons are stored. And they were finally apprehended, and uh, Bix sent, spent uh, six months in prison for that. Uh, several of the others spent several years. So how do we get in this mess, and, and where are we now? Uh, nuclear weapons were developed uh, during World War II uh, in a race with Nazi Germany, and it was considered that if the Allies didn't win the race, uh, then 
Germany would win the war with nuclear weapons. And that's where the Manhattan Project uh, was developed. And the United States developed the first weapons and used them uh, for only the, the first and only time against uh, civilian populations at Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war, although the Japanese were within weeks of surrendering anyway. Uh, just Harry Truman uh, said, we have discovered the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. This weapon is to be used against Japan. We will use it so that military objectives and soldiers and sailors are the target and not women and children. Well, that's history. So these are from official documents. Um, the strategic deterrence has been the sole mission of the uh, fleet ballistic missile submarine. These are the submarines at Bangor. Uh, we have the largest collection of uh, nuclear weapons right here at on Hood Canal. Uh, it's the nation's most survivable and enduring nuclear strike capability and it remains and it, it remains the center of the nuclear triad and as we are reducing weapons Trident is gaining more and more centrality to American nuclear weapons project, uh, projection around the world. The 2010 Nuclear Posture Review, this is the Obama administration. Uh, the key thing here is, is number five. They want to prevent nuclear proliferation, reduce the role of the weapons in uh, our security strategy. Uh, but five, they're going to sustain, we are going to sustain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal until such time as these other things are gone. And this is the, the trip point where we are now rebuilding the entire nuclear weapons complex. And they, dis they deferred or refused to de-alert the weapons. That means take the weapons off uh, almost instantaneous capacity to, to launch, uh, which means that we're still on hair trigger alert uh, with, uh, with Russia. The quadrennial uh, defense review every four years, this again is the Obama administration, nuclear capabilities will be maintained as a core mission for the Department of Defense. Vision 2020, keep this in mind, uh, this is from the year 2000. Uh, this was the Bush administration, but it's still American policy. Full spectrum dominance is the key term. Full spectrum dominance means the ability of U.S. forces operating alone or with allies to defeat any adversary and control any situation across the range of military operations, land, sea, air, or space. So are we worshiping the warships? As the U.S. and Russia reduce our nuclear arsenals, the Tridents become the primary launch platform. These are the deployed uh, Tridents. There are 14 of them. Eight of them uh, are home ported here in Bangor. So we have the, the predominant nuclear force on the West Coast, and it's been shifted toward China, and I'll talk about this a little more, away from the old Soviet Union and Russia, because we are, in fact, uh, carrying on negotiations with Russia. So naval base Kitsap Banger, uh, it's the home to the most lethal concentration of weapons of mass destruction anywhere in the world. There's not another place on the planet that has control over as much destructive capability as our folks right here on Hood Canal. It's also the pride of the Navy. And when they brought the USS Pennsylvania in, uh, this is one of the Trident submarines, it was a huge Navy celebration. It's now been retrofitted with D-5 missiles. These are missiles that can go four to 5,000 miles, and where the C-4, the, small, uh, the smaller uh, missiles, could hit a baseball diamond at 3,000 miles, the D-5 can hit home plate at 4,000 miles. These are highly accurate first strike weapons, and this is why Robert Aldridge, when he was working for Lockheed and developing the Trident system, left the work uh, alerted uh, folks around the country. Uh, that's when Jim and Shelley Douglas learned about it and started the Ground Zero community. Uh, and Bob and Janet Aldrich have been involved in this ever since, and their families. So the medical environmental and, and environmental consequences. Uh, the W-88 warhead is uh, uh, almost a half megaton uh, hydrogen bomb, uh, which the Tridents can carry on their 24 missiles uh, four to a missile, uh, four to five to a missile. So they can carry up to 96 of these weapons. This is just going to take a look at what one of these weapons would do over the city of Seattle. Uh, the red dots in the center, that's Seattle. Um, up on 
Uh, the left is uh, sub-base Banger. It's about 20 miles, 20 air miles. So the red dot in the very center is the fireball. This is the heat of the sun, uh, which melts dirt. Uh, the orange uh, is a near total fatalities. That goes out to about two kilometers uh, from ground zero. Um, the green dot uh, is widespread blast destruction. Uh, anything that's not hidden behind a hill or some uh, other huge uh, kind of object is going to be blown down uh, right back to its sort of steel frame. And then third degree burns for anybody that happens to be in the direct uh, line of, of the blast. Uh, third degree burns, uh, those are the, the ones that put you into the burn units in places like Harborview. But keep in mind that the one burn unit in, the, in this particular region is in that red dot in the center. It's gone. Okay, and we have, it's, it's the largest this side of the Mississippi, and they have, I think, capacity for about 50 burn patients. We're talking about a metropolitan area here of probably a million during the day, uh, 600,000 uh, at night, and many, many of those folks would be burned and there'd be no medical res response. Up, up on the right there is just taking a look at what the Hiroshima bomb looks like in comparison. That's just one bomb. If we set off a number of these bombs to the rough equivalent of 100 megatons, uh, you get nuclear winter, as Carl Sagan and the others described it in the 1980s, uh, whereby it would block out the sun for up to two or three months, uh, basically destroying agriculture, uh, starvation, and all the rest of that. More recently, uh, they've done, uh, with the much more powerful climate programs that they have now, uh, a new look at what would happen if only 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs were unleashed between India and Pakistan, for example. Uh, and what, what it shows is it's much more devastating an environmental impact than uh, was originally uh, thought. Uh, their work suggests that 20 million people in this South Asian war between India and Pakistan uh, could die in the first two weeks from the immediate blast and the, the short-term effects, and up to a billion people, uh, because of the climate uh, effects, uh, would be at, at risk. There's a close to three quarters of a billion people in that region of Asia that are already food insecure. And if the agricultural <coughs> capacities uh, are essentially destroyed by blocking out the sun for weeks to months, that those folks would very likely die of starvation. This is just taking a look at what would happen on day nine. Uh, you can see the smoke around the globe. This is around the globe. We know from Mount St. Helens some of this information. This is day 49. It's not just the northern hemisphere anymore. It's all the way down uh, to the south of South America. That's the environmental impact of a small nuclear war. Uh, if the United States and Russia, for example, were to unleash theirs, uh, that would be a total catastrophe. A Trident submarine carries roughly 30 times the nuclear capacity, the nuclear explosive capacity of this war that I'm talking about. So how many are there? Well, we'll just go through this quickly. If you look at the bottom, you'll see it, that they're deployed. The US has about 1,950, 650. These are at Bangor. These are the deployed weapons. The stored weapons um, are a little higher. Uh, and it's only the US, Russia, uh, Britain, and France that actually are deploying their weapons at this point. China uh, has about 300. Uh, India and Pakistan each have about 100 each. Israel has 80 in the capacity to maybe make 200. They have the plutonium for 200. Uh, and Korea has something, North Korea has something less than 10. Um, now, since Russia's are really only strategic nuclear threat, it's the only country that has the, the large armaments, um, you know, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, what's going on is that there's been a shift toward China. Um, and that's when uh, the balance of the Trident subs came from Kings Bay on the east coast and the Atlantic coast, Kings Bay, Georgia, uh, out to Bangor, out here on the west coast. Uh, and that shift took place about a decade ago. Uh, and now there's much more going on. 
in terms of, of trying to confront China. Interestingly, there has been some tension with the Soviet, with uh, the former Soviets, with Russia, um, and that's over the America, uh, the United States, and NATO ringing Russia with uh, missile defense capacities, uh, much of which is now seaborne uh, on ships. Uh, but anyway, Medvedev in 2000 and uh, November 23rd, 2011, um, essentially said, if the situation continues to develop, not to Russia's favor, we reserve the right to discontinue further disarmament and control of measures, may withdraw from the start, and they're talking about putting weapons right on the, the border of of Europe in Kaliningrad. Well, in fact, they did that. Uh, they did that just about uh, uh, two or three months ago. Um, this is the Trident. Uh, this is the Russian version of the Trident ship. This is the Bulova, uh, and they have successfully tested uh, their missiles. Finally, as of about two years ago, they had a number of failures, but they finally got it working. And this is uh, what. Uh, Vladimir Putin has just stationed these uh, nuclear missiles in Kaliningrad, which is uh, right next to uh, Poland, Poland and Estonia, right next to the Baltic uh, Sea there. So where are we now? Obama in 2008 in Prague was saying we need to get rid of these weapons. Uh, but in fact, uh, Chuck Hagel, uh, who briefly belonged to uh, the group Global Zero, which is a number of, of uh, uh, international uh, leaders, uh, political leaders, country leaders, and so on, calling for zero nuclear weapons. He has resigned from Global Zero, and he's now saying uh, that the United States has always supported a strong nuclear deterrent and would continue to do so, even as it braces for a nuclear forces overhaul that analysts say could cost a trillion dollars over 30 years. His closing comment, he added, the country has always been willing to make that investment, and I think it will continue to make it. And he's in the process of going around after all of the, the bad news about uh, soldiers and sailors uh, on nuclear alert, the ones in the silos and so on, the bad morale problem going around trying to sort of buck them up a little bit. Uh, and the nuclear triad is also up for uh, modernization, but in particular the, the Trident system itself is up for uh, modernization, and that's something we're going to try to work on here. But the Center for Nonproliferation Studies calculated that the upgrade of the uh, nuclear triad would cost a trillion dollars over 30 years. So, what are we bomb? Well, here's Chengdu. Um, we've been there. That's this is where the uh, the Panda Reserve is. It's just outside of Chengdu. Um, we, we stopped there on our way up to uh, Lhasa uh, when we went to the IPPNW meeting in Beijing in 2003. Uh, it's, a, it's a city of 14 million people. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the United States Air Force will dramatically expand its military presence across the Pacific this year. This is a little earlier this year. Sending jets to Thailand, India, Singapore, and Australia. The idea behind its pivot is simple. Ring China with U.S. and allied forces, just like the West did to the Soviet Union back in the Cold War. So we're on our way for another Cold War. The military need to keep going is huge. Um, okay. Uh, just a quick comment about the, the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Uh, this is the tsunami coming into Fukushima. This is the Fukushima power plant, and all four of the reactors there melted down. Uh, they have yet to get them under control in 2014. They are still radiating the ocean. They're, in fact, they're finding microscopic um, cesium uh, from Fukushima in some of the fish in Puget Sound. It's not in any way a health risk. It's just telling us how it's dispersing through the environment. And this is just sort of the, the, the back talk. The Bloom, uh, Bloomberg Business Week uh, is basically saying it's not a big deal. Uh, Fukushima has not had a tremendous effect on the industry, uh, of the, says Jeremy Gordon of the World Nuclear Association. So they're out there pushing away. 
so what does it cost us? Uh, nuclear weaponry takes about a third of the U.S. defense budget if you sort of take all the different ways in which it goes through different parts of the budget. Uh, this is just taking a quick look at it. Nuclear forces, expected additional costs, and so on. Um, uh, this slideshow, by the way, I can put it up on the web and people, folks are welcome to take it down and look at it in more detail. Uh, the SSBNs, that's the Trident submarines. Uh, uh, their lifespan goes through 2040. Uh, and the plan right now is to build 12 new ones. They're going to be the same length. They're going to have, rather than 24 tubes, they're going to have 16. Uh, I think the British Tridents are going to have 12 missile tubes. Um, and a price tag of, it's, it's actually about $93 billion right now, starting with uh, when the Ohio, which was the first, uh, ends its life uh, cycle in 2029. But they're already spending about a billion dollars a year right now on planning uh, and design. Through the Pacific Life community, we had a chance to go to Los Alamos a few years back. and. Uh, they're basically rebuilding a facility there to take the place of Rocky Flats, which was the plutonium uh, production facility, the production facility for the pits for the nuclear weapons. Uh, the United States signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, but it, which calls for a steady uh, disarmament in good faith, but we're in fact rebuilding our capacity to build up these weapons again. So what do we do now? Well, it's our responsibility to do the best we can to make sure these weapons are never used again. That's the key piece. There are a number of international uh, efforts that are going on right now. ICANN, International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, uh, was started by International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and now uh, has about 80 international NGOs working together internationally. Uh, and they're uh, sponsoring the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons work. Uh, there was a conference in Sweden um, and a new conference coming up in uh, Mexico City here so shortly. The International Red Crescent Red Cross uh, has taken it on as uh, a total violation of, of health and, and uh, humanitarian concerns, and they want the abolition. Global Zero, uh, we've talked about. These are international leaders, many uh, political figures. United Nations Non-Aligned Movement, I'll say a little more about that, has 125 delegations calling for it. And then there's us. That's you and me, but also the United States. We're the sort of principal driver of uh, nuclear weapons development. The Non-Aligned Movement um, has uh, made this statement, the realization of a world free from nuclear weapons is the group of non-aligned uh, movement states, parties, highest priority. So we do have many allies in all of this. The Conference on Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons uh, in Norway uh, took a hit in the long time conflict between Norway and Sweden when the Swedish uh, ambassador said that Norway wasn't a serious state and the states that came were not serious states to consider the humanitarian consequences of these weapons. U.S. State Department I said for that, and they're about to do the same thing, only after careful consideration, yuck, 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 um, in close consultation with the rest of the P5, that's the, those are the five nuclear halves uh, that are on the Security Council, we decided not to attend. Uh, and basically they said that it's a distraction from the sort of the process that they're in, involved in. You can come out to Bangor. This is the front gate of Bangor, for those of you that haven't been there. This is the main gate. This is the, uh, the blue line. Uh, yeah, well, there's some commentary here that doesn't, you won't see it at the base, but uh, in terms of base closed and some other things here, they won't, they won't tell you that there's weapons of mass destruction there. That's a national secret. Uh, yuck, yuck. Okay. Um, we can't even hang the signs over the free, freeway overpass anymore because they're afraid we're going to drop it on somebody's head. Uh, this is the uh, current explosives handling warp. This is where they uh, crane the missiles in and out of the submarines. Uh, and they do that on a regular basis to uh, refurbish, you know, check them and so on. And they're now wanting to build a second wharf. Uh, in fact, they've already started at a, at a cost of about 700 and some odd million dollars. Uh, and we, in fact, uh, the local uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and Ground Zero together have just filed an appeal to uh, the judge's dismissal of our lawsuit against the Navy uh, trying to uh, 
essentially force the Navy to do a realistic environmental uh, assessment of the possibility that one of these missiles explodes and what would happen in the surrounding community. The Navy's so far said it's less than one in a million possibility and they've refused to do it. And the judge in the local district uh, went along with that. So we're about to appeal that to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, this is just the judge's rejection of the, uh, um, of the lawsuit. Uh, we've also started a, a No to New Trident uh, program. Leonard Iger is, is the one that's leading this. This is No to the Rebuild of the Trident System. We're trying to get to our Congress people here. Uh, Rick Larson and Adam Smith are both on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, and we're trying to get them to kind of show some backbone against the military industrial complex. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're roughly estimating $350 billion to build and operate these for another 40 years into the end of, uh, the, of this century. Uh, this is the Ground Zero House. This is the Ground Zero Gathering. This is the Precious Earth. And this is Ground Zero. Thank you very much. So I want to uh, invite Bix to come on up here. Uh, Bix is my hero. He is a, a one-person uh, peace group uh, with always, always somebody uh, in his in his trail. The, the funnest birthday party I ever went to was Bix's 80th birthday party over at uh, St. Leo's. Is that where we were? Uh, Holy Cross. Holy Cross. Sorry, at Holy Cross, 300 people showed up for his birthday party, and he said all he wanted for his birthday. Uh, as a present was for people to come with him out to Bangor and uh, vigil at the gate. Not necessarily even get arrested, but to vigil at the gate. And over 70 people went with him out there to Bangor. This man's amazing. He's been to uh, Hiroshima. Uh, he's been to, uh, most recently, Jeju Island. Uh, I didn't show you some of the slides there, but he can talk about that. Um, he's, he's been to Fastlane, which is uh, the site of the British Trident submarines. Um, Bix, come and talk about these wonderful things that you've done. Well, really, I'd, I'd rather have David just continue. You know. <laughs> and I hope to you know, uh, live up to his uh, great portrait of me. But uh, and um, so I guess I would say just initially, uh, my life at Bangor began in the 70s. I think the uh, first time I was arrested there was 1976 when we carried a replica of the Trident into the base itself. And then there have been a number of actions since then. Um, but more than anything, I think, um, you know, it's just to, to be in touch with uh, Great people like David Hall and his wife Anne and all the different people and Tom Carlin and that have worked and been so faithful in resistance to this, you know, and uh, that's what it takes resistance. Um, and then over the years, I know that just uh, when we had the fire up there, one of the houses that we had at Ground Zero it uh, burned. We're not quite sure of the origin of the fire, but anyway, it, we had to rebuild, and that was uh, the one that really spearheaded that was David Hall, you know, to make sure that we would uh, be there, be there, be there, certainly as long as those weapons are there. And uh, but what I wanted just to, to speak a little bit too about. Uh, you know, um, uh, well, number one, just the horror of nuclear weapons, you know. For the most part, I think we all, are, to a certain degree in, in our, our population, it's pretty much, you know, a shrug of the shoulders, nuclear weapons, so what's the big deal, you know? Uh, there was a rise in awareness, certainly during the 80s, but then now it's, uh, you know, they're there, you know, don't get so excited, you know, uh, and, um, you know, we're not going to use them or, you know, then uh, there are those who say, well, yes, let's use them. And, uh, but uh, it, it's just, you know, they breed nothing but hopelessness, you know. 
I think Dick McSorty, who taught at uh, Georgetown, a Jesuit priest, and uh, he said that the, uh, the taproot of violence in our society is because of our ascent to nuclear weapons, to use, to ascent to the fact, the use of nuclear weapons, you know? <coughs> and, um, and so we can trace, you know, just the tremendous rise in violence in our own society, you know? It's, uh, uh, as I say, the biggest assault rifle we have is a nuclear weapon, and then down, you know, everyone has armed themselves with uh, guns galore uh, against one another. And so we live in a climate of hopelessness and fear that it's pretty pervasive, I think. And so I think, you know, that, uh, you know, just uh, a nuclear weapon is anything but our friend. You know, it's anything but a deterrent. There's been more and more wars that have happened, you know, that has since our nuclear shield, since our nuclear deterrent policies. Um, but they are intended, nuclear weapons are intended to rip the flesh off the body, to rip and destroy and distort and burn, sizzle and to uh, vaporize and uh, have people just stand briefly with ha skin hanging from their arms, from their bodies. You know, they're, they are anything but human. And how can we allow that within our midst? There are, of course, there are, there are uh, hundreds of issues in the United States, whether it's the war in Afghanistan, or our drone bombing, or Pakistan, or uh, Iraq, um, you know, or the Sudan, or, um, you know, what happens in our own country as far as uh, the health care, education, the things that are so desperately needed by people. There are 10,000 things, but to me, what, what sits in the middle of all that is the reason we're pushing people around is our nuclear weapon superiority, you know, and I think that's the heart and soul of resistance. And I, I just would like to mention a little bit about uh, going to... Uh, Jeju Island of South Korea. How many of here in here have heard of Jeju Island before? Oh, okay, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's great. Well, I had not, this is a couple of years ago, and I had not heard of Jeju Island until uh, I think Bruce Gagnon and Dennis Apple went over there and they made a documentary, and I, I was amazed to see that. First of all, uh, you know, it's this island about 60 miles south of mainland South Korea, you know, the peninsula, and, uh, and also had no idea that the Navy was building another Navy base there against the will and wishes of the people, you know. Uh, and they've already destroyed the coral reefs surrounding the island and the rocks, which are very sacred to them, which have great ceremonial, sacred, uh, sacred meaning and significance to them. You know, that's been destroyed. Um, and just, you know, it, it was dedicated by one of the uh, prime ministers of, of uh, South Korea as an island, an international island of peace. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the deep contradiction about these weapons of destruction that will be introduced into this port, you know, of uh, at Jeju Island. And, um, and the, um, uh, you know, it'll be a port where they're not quite clear. They think it'll, it'll be a port for aircraft carriers as well as Trident, uh, Trident submarines. And certainly it would be a, a port for the Aegis Destroyer, which is a prime missile defense system that we have now. You know, and uh, and they're linking that missile defense system up with Japan as well, and they're trying to do that with Korea as well. You know, the uh, whole sense of uh, the uh, uh, you know we will you know, as David pointed out, we are surrounding China, and this now the North or South Koreans are very aware of this, that this base is being put up not to be any defense against North Korea, as they were saying, as much as to ring China. It's, it's something like 350 kilometers from, uh, from China itself, you know? And it's intended to be uh, a part of that ring, you know? But for me, going there was, uh, 
was probably one of the most uh, moving experiences I've had of, of a faith community in resistance to uh, in resistance to real militarism, in resistance to this thing, you know, that's been going on for seven years, what's happened there, and uh, and every day, every day they're there blocking, there are two gates now, uh, where they block these two gates, the people, the villagers, and what really drew my attention, there's a lot of Catholic priests and nuns there. I would say, gee, if this happened in the United States, they say, ship me there somewhere, you know. But, but there it was, and I saw that, and I thought it was wonderful, you know. And, uh, and then to see also to meet a bishop who was just very, not supportive, but is a, re, is a real inspiration for this, for this resistance, you know. And then my own uh, Jesuit order, they have three of the Jesuits, uh, have been assigned full-time resistance to the naval base, which, uh, which upped the Jesuits in my own estimation a bit. And, <laughs> but anyway, I was, uh, I was just so taken by their consistency. And to me, it was, uh, to me, I thought I saw there uh, a pool of strength, of spirituality, Though they, they feel less than, less than uh, David and Goliath, uh, they feel very insignificant in a lot of ways, you know. But every day they are there. Every day they don't miss. They are there constantly, you know, day in, day out. And they, they have nuns orders in South Korea. They have about, I think it's about 18, that they have pledged two nuns a week, each order pledges two nuns a week to fly into uh, to the villages, uh, Gangjon village and Jeju Island is where the base is going up. And, uh, but, you know, just the, the constancy, the commitment, I was just, I was so deeply moved by that, you know, and uh, would hope, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, they are a real sign, just like, the works of war are constant and unrelenting. So, uh, so the works of peace there on Jeju are just, they're unrelenting, even though they know that they are vastly outnumbered and, uh, you know, but they, they continue. And they, to me, it was a great, great sign of hope uh, that they, they showed there on it. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, I think I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my understanding was that the uh, U.S. had a foreign policy objective of keeping the Korean Peninsula nuclear free. Now, what happened to that? Really? Uh, point. I thought Obama said we are going to keep the Korean Peninsula nuclear free. That is our objective. Uh, yeah, that's news to me. <laughs> that's news to no, no, I know. I said that's news to me. That's news to you. Yeah, right. It may be yeah. that he's keeping uh, South Korea nuclear free in terms of not having any nuclear weapons present on yeah. on the land in yeah. in South Korea. But uh, the Trident submarines are patrolling there. Uh, and there so was, this is a base for them. The the base on Jeju. Yeah, Jeju. Uh, is a Korean base built by the Korean military, but it will be used, as I understand it, exclusively by the U.S. military. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's being, uh, it's the uh, agent, the construction agent is uh, Samsung. You know. That is the American company? That's, no, that's, a, that's a Korean company. Korean company. It's a Korean company, okay. yeah. And like David said, yeah, I think it is, you know, that, you know, as far as uh, nuclear weapons being, uh, being installed on Korea, I think there is that uh, agreement. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but but this, this stands outside that agreement. Yeah. Right. Keep in mind that the, the Trident submarine. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but uh, it patrols at Cold War levels at this point. The missiles on that uh, on those subs. There's uh, typically there's four of them at sea at any given time. They roam the entire Pacific out the Indian Ocean uh, from the Atlantic side uh, across the Atlantic. There's not a city on Earth that's outside of a 30-minute missile strike by a Trident submarine, given, given the appropriate codes from the President of the United States. 
Well, that was going to be a follow-up question. I don't want to hog the discussion, but who, who, what is the chain of command that would lead to an order to fire one of those missiles from a Trident submarine? How does that happen? Well, I mean, officially, as I understand it, the president has to be the one. But in the event that the president is not available, there actually, I understand, are uh, emergency procedures whereby the commander of a submarine under extreme circumstances uh, would be allowed. They have as well, uh, and Tom Rogers talks about this, Tom is a uh, veteran Navy submarine captain who now works with us at Ground Zero. He spent 30 years uh, chasing the Ruskies, chase, chasing the Soviets around the Pacific and his submarine tailing the Soviet submarines. Uh, he told us that the standing orders are for the captain, if he refuses to fire, uh, given a legitimate order, is to be removed, shot and killed if necessary, uh, and, and so on, and, and the missiles are to be fired. So there are these um, so-called assurances that the policies will be carried out uh, that are in the policy. Um, it's hard to know. If you look at the, uh, the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is the closest we've come to something uh, recently, there were three Soviet officers on a nuclear-armed submarine uh, in the Cuban waters that essentially had an order to fire, but they had a policy that said all three officers had to agree, and only one officer uh, refused to fire, and that's the only reason that they didn't launch a nuclear weapon at the United States in 1962. Yeah. That's, you can look that at Arkhipov, I believe was his name. Uh, you can look that up on Wikipedia. Yeah, so I saw that uh, history in the documentary of those Russian submarines. What, what you're saying is very scary, that the that, that sub-commanders in the United States Navy, would, under certain circumstances, would have that authority, because mistakes can be made. Uh, no question. I mean, there's, there's plenty of evidence for close calls. The most uh, recent highly publicized one was like in 1995 when the U.S. set off a uh, weather satellite from Norway and the back channel to the Soviet embassy didn't turn it in and uh, at that point uh, I think it was Yeltsin, I'm not sure he was sober, yeah. had out the nuclear football and he had yeah. about seven minutes to decide whether to retaliate or not. Uh, again, these are all sort of written up. Uh, we also had an, an accident out here at Bangor with one of the missiles where in 2003 they winched a stepladder that was in the silo to hook the winch cable onto the top of the, uh, of the missile got left there while they went to lunch and some different crew came in and, and winched the missile up with the stepladder, the foot of the stepladder getting within about a foot of one of the warheads on the bus at the top of the missile. There was no particular risk that the nuclear part of the uh, missile would go off, but there's close to three million pounds of TNT in the propellant in the missiles, uh, so that if it were to ignite, uh, ignite the missile fuel, that there could have been an enormous dispersion of, well, the weapons themselves, the plutonium in the weapons, uh, and so on. Uh, and that was 2003 right here on Hook Canal. Uh, Dave, I've got some doc a document here that if people want to you know, look at it, I dug up some of those incidents, some of the more significant close calls, um, including the one you referred to with a Three officers, well, two of them agreed to, <coughs> to, to agree to fire, yeah. and the one disagreed. But uh, if anybody wants to take a look at it, thanks. Uh, want to tell them about the international <coughs> peace thing? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, part. Um, there's going to be. Uh, there's a Jesuit priest who was working on a, an international conference on Jeju Island sometime in the uh, in the fall, you know, or possibly late August, you know. But uh, but.
but he's very interested in uh, representation, I think, from different countries uh, and, uh, and to meet there, I think, in Gangjon Village itself. You know, so there's a, a bit of a momentum building that way, for, uh, although that isn't uh, too well publicized as yet. Yeah. Yeah, but right at this point, it's not definite, but they're thinking about late August or in the fall. Um, and also, they, they have hopes that, uh, well, this is kind of a religious bite, but uh, Pope Francis is supposed to visit uh, South Korea sometime about that time. They want to they wanna get him there on Jeju. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that could be. That could. <laughs> that could be. Anybody interested in hearing Biggs talk about walking into the banger base? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Did you well, we, invited in? Yeah, we were invited in. Yeah, but it was. Uh, yeah. Well, there were there were five of us. It was Steve Kelly. He's a Jesuit priest too, and then uh, Sister uh, Sister Ann Montgomery, who since has died, and then uh, Susan Crane, uh, who had lived in a Jonah house for a number of years before she came out to the West, and also Lynn Greenwald, who lives in Tacoma with us at the Catholic Worker Place. Uh, but anyway, we had met for almost a year, you know, deciding what are we going to do and how are we going to do this, you know, about nuclear weapons. And uh, we've somewhat had an idea it would probably be Bangor in some way or something, you know, but uh, we weren't quite sure. So that was part of our discernment process that we had met. Uh, we met a couple times a month, you know, for almost a year and then trying to discern, pray over it. and then. Finally, it ended up, yes, we will go into the Bangor base. And then um, we had, on Google, we had seen the, what David mentioned, Swift Pack. That's Strategic Weapons Pacific. That's where uh, the nuclear weapons are stored. And we looked at that, you know, and it, very, very, it looked very, very uh, forbidden and it looked very uh, intimidating and everything else, you know. And, um, but anyway, we thought, well, maybe we can get close to there, you know. And um, so we started, we cut our way through one fence, mm -hmm. and then uh, it was early in the morning, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and then we were heading down the road, and then we, we, uh, we thought we were going to have to go through the brush and bushes and everything, but we found that this time in the morning we could use the roads there. You know, they have a regular village there, so. We, uh, one car did come while we walked, we all hit the bushes, you know, and uh, so we, uh, okay, and then we followed, uh, there was a power line that went down about a mile, you know, down towards the, uh, the uh, Trident Pier, or the, sorry, the Delta Pier, so we followed that, and then at that, we weren't quite sure, we had to stop when we got there, whether, uh, uh, Steve Kelly was thinking a little bit, well, maybe we ought to, if they're, you know, go take a look and see if there's a trident there, and then he thought maybe we could swim out to that. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I said, uh, I'll, I'll, stick with the, I'll stick with the other place. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, we decided there we'd uh, go, uh, we'd go to the, uh, where the weapons are stored, and so, uh, and while we were walking up this road, uh, you know, on the, very much on the fringe of the road, there were four trucks came by at a very high speed, you know. And uh, so anyway, we all ducked inside the woods there. And then, then we found the little road that led right to the northern part of the, uh, the, uh, the, where the swift pack, where the weapons are stored. So we got down into that area. And uh, we expected, you know, something to happen. It was a lethal force authorized area, so we didn't know, we didn't know what was going to happen there. And uh, so, or whether the dogs would be coming or what. Uh, 
So we got up, we got to the first fence, and uh, well, I was amazed we got that far. You know, we had bolt cutters, and so we let the bolt cutters do the work for us, and we cut through that. And then there was a there was a pathway about 15 feet from the other fence, and so and that was. Uh, uh, that, that had a lot of uh, sensitive transmission and other uh, wires, and so we cut through that. And, uh, and then we got through, we just got through when the Marines came, you know. So the Marines came and then they, uh, they had their assault weapons out and everything, and then they, uh, they, uh, they, no time at all, they had us all flat down on their face, you know, and uh, uh, then they hooded us first, you know, they put, put hoods on our head, and, uh, like we're at Guantanamo, and then, uh, and, uh, then, uh, yeah, then we were, we were on the ground probably about three and a half hours, something. Then we were taken in and uh, questioned by the FBI and the, and the Navy security officers. Uh, what did you, you say when, when they said, what are you doing here? Uh, what are we saying? <laughs> well, kind of, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are they doing here? <laughs> so, are they amazed you've gotten that far? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they were, yeah. The, they didn't have anyone penetrate that far before, you know, and so they were. Well, I was too. <laughs> Did you have any signs or any indication to tell who you were? Well, yeah, we did. We carried banners there, and, uh, you know, we tried to, uh, you know, we see uh, abolish nuclear weapons, and then we all carried blood, little vials of blood, uh, which and then hammers. We we go in the, uh, following the uh, injunction of Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and so we carry in hammers and... Uh, blood to pour blood. You see, it's uh, a lot of plowshares actions. It'll be uh, weapon, uh, be missiles or that you'll pour the blood on. And this way we just poured the blood on the fences. We were about 20, probably about, I'd say about oh, maybe uh, 15 yards from where the weapons were stored. That's uh, yeah, you know. They were right behind in that bunker, right behind it. We were, we're inside, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bill, uh, in, in the courtroom itself, were you allowed to make your case before the judge as as the SOA watch uses the courtroom in Fort Benning to to articulate the reasons why this civil disobedience has been done? Did the judge give you that authority or that right, that time to explain your case? Uh, no, see <clears throat> what happens. You know they don't they don't allow international law or a necessity defense at all in the courtroom, in the federal courtroom. There's a gag order like that, and if you bring up any of the reasons why you do this, you know it, it's a it's against international law, it's against morality, it's against United States law, right. and so forth. Yeah, you can make you can make statements. Um, you know, uh, about your own state of mind, or you can make statements about, uh, you know, uh, what is dear to you or what, uh, what is um, uh, the uh, motivation out of which you come, you know. Uh, uh, well, on what charge were you put into jail? Trespassing on federal property? No, well, the destruction of government property and then Depredation of government property, conspiracy, and then trespass. Uh, so, so it was the cutting. The cutting of the wire was the destruction of government yeah, property. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the conspiracy part was what? Well, that we we um, conspired together. Conspired together. You know. To, you're right. Which we certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, that's, that's a good, you know, I mean, you're not really as far as what's, uh, uh, as far as what's admissible in the federal courts, as far as international law or necessity to defend them, that they, uh, they outlaw it. You know? Why did but, you get a lighter sentence than the others? I think it was uh, age, I think, yeah. But both uh, Sister Anne Montgomery, 
who had done many more plowshares actions than I, we both got later sentences than the other. Bill, was there unrelieved hostility from your jailers and all those people? I mean, was there any sympathy? Among the uh, others in jail, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. think, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, I mean they, um, yeah, th there was a, there was a sense, uh, you know, that uh, you know you did this out of conviction and so forth, you know, and uh, so th there was no there was no real real hostility, you know, on it. Uh, <clears throat> Could you talk a little bit about the jury and the jury? It was a jury trial. Yes. How that all transpired. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. It was. Uh, it didn't take the jury very long to, de you know, to deliberate. You know, they took them about uh, an hour and a half, and they came out with the verdict guilty. We we somewhat expected that, you know, it would happen, but we didn't think it'd be that fast, you know. Uh, but there was one young guy that was on the jury that, <clears throat> after they, you know, the. Uh, the guilty, which had to be unanimous, he came up to a couple of us and apologized. He, you know, he said uh, he, the pressure was too great. You know, the pressure was too great to go to go with the guilty guilty plea. <coughs> uh, <coughs> what? What would have happened to him? I mean, what if he stood up? Oh, then it would have been a hung jury. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys would have gone free. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, there would have had to have been another trial. Yeah. Yeah, they would have. Yeah, there'd be another trial. <clears throat> May I interject something? The most remarkable thing I thought about the trial was when Biggs pulled out a pocket version of the Constitution and went to read from it yeah. and was told, sorry, that's not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's really Thank you. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> that's <a> good move. <clears throat> I can't let the jury hear that. No. <laughs> the Constitution. That's right. Could you talk a little more about the current administration and what they're doing? You said on the one hand, they're refurbishing their nuclear weapons. But Obama, in the early in his administration, said that we should get rid of nuclear weapons. Right. So, yeah, but there's a caveat. If you go back to the Prague speech in 2008, which is where he said, you know, we need to get rid of these things, he said, but we're not going to do it. Uh, you know, we're going to maintain our nuclear deterrent, uh, you know, until such time as whatever the process is. Uh, so it's, and that's what I was telling you about it. Also, in terms of the uh, the nuclear posture review, uh, is that. Uh, it's maintaining the capacities uh, far into the future, and it's not clear what the plan is in relation to negotiating our way out of or toward zero, uh, away from the nuclear weapons era. Uh, there's been good work with Russia. It's, it's gone backwards to some degree, especially since Putin's come in, but also uh, if you look at if you look at the maps of the way in which the United States military bases surround Russia, surround China, uh, surround Iran, uh, we have something on the order of 1,100 military bases around the world, seven or 800 in the U.S. Uh, China, you know, if you look at what China does, they don't have any bases outside of China. They have a number of, of airfields. Uh, we are in Lhasa in 2003, and we saw uh, the jets going in and out of the Lhasa Airport, the Chinese jets, and they, you know, some other folks said they ran into uh, a, an army convoy of about 100 vehicles uh, going around Tibet at that time. This is 2003. The Chinese are very well armed, uh, and they are apparently beginning to build up their nuclear weapons. They have about 300 right now. Uh, and Experts have said that's enough for any country. You know, I already told you, just 100 weapons by themselves is enough to just devastate whole areas. So the notion about mutual assured destruction is still with us uh, in the sense that if you use these weapons against the country that has weapons to use back against you, uh, it's going to be catastrophe on both ends of, uh, of the barrel. Uh, so 
I don't know what we're pushing for, what we keep pushing for politically is to see if there can't be some intensive diplomatic kind of uh, movement. There are a number of countries in the United Nations, for example, that are pushing a nuclear weapons convention that was developed by NGOs. Uh, but it's got to get past the Security Council, which is you know ruled by the P5, you know, the, the five nuclear weapons countries, uh, so that the the structure of the United Nations uh, has a pretty firm veto over the notion of eliminating nuclear weapons until the countries that own them and have them, especially the United States, uh, you know, decide to, to get rid of them. Bottom line, uh, you know, as, as military folks, you'd understand this. There is no morality with the the policy that an empire is going to predict. It's all about power, and the United States is the most powerful empire ever. We have the largest military. We have the largest reach. Uh, we have the strongest economy. Uh, so, in trying to get rid of these weapons, uh, we are directly confronting with moral issues, uh, a system that doesn't base any of its decision making on moral authorities. There's been a, a big effort in the last uh, five years or so trying to push the notion of the humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons should be a reason they should never be used, they should be eliminated. Uh, there was a, a conference in Norway, the P5 boycotted it. There's one coming up in Mexico. P5 are going to boycott that again. And what you hear back as the reason is that it's, it gets in the way of the negotiating process that they worked out with the other countries. There's probably some truth to that, but on the other hand, without any kind of moral core to the decision making, um, the notion of ever going to get rid of something that powerful that has that much uh, that much inertia in terms of the military industrial investment in these weapons. Um, you know, we're the mosquito and the elephants here. Mm. Mm. I'm wondering what the morale is of the blue and gold crews that go out on these Trident submarines. Uh, do you suppose that a lot of the sailors and even officers on those boats are, are questioning, why, why are we doing this anymore? The, the Cold War is over. Why are we going on these long patrols with these with these weapons of mass destruction. Well, if, if you've watched the, the national news, uh, Chuck Hagel, the Secretary of Defense, is going around to the missile silos and stuff like that, trying to raise the morale, which has been horrible, yeah. in, in the missile silos. What's going on with the blue and gold crews? I haven't heard anything specific about that, but Ground Zero continues to, to leaflet, uh, and when allowed, will send, uh, used to be 600 leaflets onto the base in a week. Uh, there's lots of folks that understand this isn't what we want. In fact, we tell the sailors the same thing. You know, we don't want you to have to deal with these suckers. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, but for now, the, the notion about patriotism, about service, uh, about having, you know, committed to stand for your country and follow orders, uh, you know, they're, they're in a box. They're, they're in a system where they've agreed to do their best under orders. And what we keep asking them to do is keep this thing safe. Don't let somebody get in there like Vicks and uh, make a mess of it. <laughs> uh, uh, don't let something bad happen with these things until we can figure out some other political way to get rid of them. What happened when there was more political strength? Archbishop Hunthausen was there. Hundreds of protesters were there in front of Bangor. What happened to all of that? Did that all fizzle out? With the fall of the Thank Berlin you. Wall. With the fall of the Soviet Union. It's been much more yeah. harder than yeah. Nationally, during the Reagan time, uh, there were like 105 NGO offices, peace offices, peace groups in Washington, D.C. After the Berlin Wall all came down and the Soviet Union collapsed, it went down to five that survived. Uh, and then they sort of built back up again. But mm -hmm. it's very hard, very hard to keep a peace movement going uh, when you don't have some kind of something that intrudes on the public's awareness, like like the U.S. Soviet mutual assured destruction did under the Reagan era, yeah. and and it's really really hard too, you know, it's, uh, to get the young people, you know, involved or interested and so forth. You know, they 
they're taken up with environmental issues more than anything else, which is uh, right on. It's, but uh, but the nuclear weapon thing does doesn't register. You know, it doesn't register. Let me tell you about one small town in Maryland that I lived in named Cole Park, Maryland that passed a nuclear freeze ordinance on a local community level. The, the city council and mayor unanimously voted for this nuclear freeze ordinance. There was a major railroad going through the town. This ordinance said no nuclear material will be allowed to be within our city limits, period. Except if there's a, a, a hospital radioisotope that needs to go into a hospital, etc. That ordinance has been on the books for 30 years. And it, it, uh, it also said that the city cannot purchase any vehicle, a police car, a bus, anything from any American corporation that has anything to do with the nuclear weapons industry. And that, that little town in Maryland, a town of 16,000, understood the importance of that ordinance. And nobody dissented. Nobody said, well, this isn't a, the business of a city council. Nobody said that. Now that the nuclear freeze movement was getting nuclear weapon-free cities, counties, towns all around the country, that was going quite strongly. And what happened to that? Well, the same thing I was just telling you about. With the loss of the Soviet Union as the sort of, you know, the demon threat, uh, it, it, it got taken away. And the other thing you look at, you, you're talking about it back here, it's the concentration of uh, corporate control over media and information uh, makes it much harder to use broad media. Right. Yeah. And I, I might also say that uh, the town city of Berkeley has come out in support of uh, Gang John Village, you know, uh, support of the uh, of the resistance that's going on in Jeju Island. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. Well, there, there's. A... If I might uh, point that that's in Korea and it says no naval base, and then we brought these over from us uh, from Jeju Island here, no naval base, and that also in. Uh, Korean. I, it's good Tom is here to show the right way to get the letters correct. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs>